This channel has received its first question. Anastasia asks, what is science? I appreciate any and all questions, and this is an especially good one. Most people think that science means following a complicated laboratory procedure to get an expected answer. That's not science. In science, you do experiments because you don't know the answer. Doing them helps you find the answer. On the surface, the various branches of science look totally different. Most people don't realise that astronomers, ecologists, microbiologists, geologists, physicists, botanists and all the other types of scientists are all doing the same thing, but they really are. What they're doing is following a systematic process of investigation. The key element that unites all sciences is careful thinking, but this is the one part of the process that we never see. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. We'll illustrate the thinking part of the scientific method using Wordle. Later in this video, we'll also look at how this method can be applied to daily life. It's very useful. At its most basic, the scientific method means thinking of many other possible explanations and testing them. Most people don't do this. Most people come up with one favorite explanation, then stick with it. Science is different to all other subjects and to the way people naturally think. Science acknowledges that people's favorite ideas may be wrong, and we have countless examples of when they were. So scientists doubt themselves. They suggest other ideas in addition to the one they like, and then try to cross off any that are wrong. They do this by experiment. You experiment to see what happens. Plus, there's a deeper purpose, to see whether what you thought should happen does happen. If it doesn't, then your understanding was wrong. If you've designed your series of experiments carefully and interpret them thoughtfully, you get information, that is, we learn something. We apply this method to nature when we don't know the answer. To make any sense of nature, we need the scientific method. Wordle is a game, not science. It's intentionally simple, whereas nature is never intentional and hardly ever simple. Nevertheless, Wordle makes visible the same combination of deductive and inductive reasoning that defines science. Wordle starts with an unknown, or we could say a mystery. There's a hidden word, and we have to find out what it is. We have nothing to help us do that except experimentation combined with disciplined thinking. We guess, blindly at first, but later with some knowledge. Each guess is a formal experiment for which the game gives us clear results. For each letter, there are only three possibilities that it's not present in the word we're trying to find, that it is present but not in the location we have given, or that we have put the right letter in the right place. This is information we can use for our next guess. We have to think carefully, keeping in mind what we know and what we don't. We consider a range of options but rule most of them out because they don't fit with what we already know. If we are sloppy, we won't properly use the information we have gained and will guess wildly. So here's the process of thinking through one Wordle game. This is how Wordle starts with a blank screen. We don't know anything except that it's a five letter word and we have to find it by deduction. So we just guess at first. This is the guess. We input it and the game will give us the feedback about whether we were correct or not. In this case, the E and the K are correct. The other letters are not in the, the mystery word. And knowing that, we guess uh, we want to find a word that has an E and a K in these positions, but which doesn't have the other letters. And that's the creative part. That's the creative part of science, too. So we'll try this. And in this case, it's a pretty good bet. 
we don't know, but we, we can try it because it matches and it doesn't contradict what we know already. Put it in and we get another clue, the C now. So we've got a C in the word somewhere, but not in that position. So again, we have to be creative. We have to find a word with a C in it somewhere with an E and a K in those positions, but which do not have, does not have, which does not have the W and the R. So this is creative. We have to think of the word. And we just guess. And this is a bad guess because it contradicts what we know. So therefore, we're not going to put it into the game. And we'll just cross it out. It's a bad guess because we already know this. the mystery word doesn't have an R. And this word does. So it's, it's incorrect. And so on. Here... This, this is a guess. We, this word doesn't have an E in it, and so therefore it's wrong. We know, that, we know the mystery word has an E. It's wrong. Keep going like this. This word also contradicts what we already know, which is that the mystery word doesn't have a W, so it's wrong. And here this word contradicts what we know. We know the mystery word doesn't have an R, and this one does. So it's wrong, and so on. And this word is missing the E that we should have. Again, we're missing an E. This word isn't worth entering into the game. It's not. We're not going to do that experiment because we already know this one is a wrong guess. And this one, <clears throat> this one might fit if it were a word, but it's not a word, so we don't use that one. And here, by this time, I was having trouble, and so although this word contradicts what we already know. I made a decision to proceed with it anyway. We know that the there's no R in the mystery word and this word has a has an R. And nevertheless I was having trouble here so I put in this word knowing that we might get something out of it, but it's not the not going to be the correct one. So I enter it and we learn something. So now we know the C is in the right place, the E is in the right place, and the K, and that the mystery word doesn't have these two other letters. Now we guess again, knowing what we know, and put this one in. And this one seems to fit. We don't know if it's correct, that's why we do this experiment. We do the experiment by entering it into the game. We run it, and we get the answer. It, it fits. Now we've learned something else. We've learned about the H now. So the mystery word we want has all these green letters in those places. And we keep guessing. And this one fits what we know. There's no contradictions with previous information. So we'd run the experiment. And that's the answer. So that's, that's how this game illustrates the scientific method. The following story is from the American Journal of Ophthalmology. In no November 1921, a doctor transcribed what Mrs. H told him about her old house. One morning, she said, I heard footsteps in the room over my head. I hurried up the stairs. To my surprise, the room was empty. I passed into the next and then into all the rooms on that floor and then to the floor above to find that I was the only person in that part of the house. Sometimes after I've gone to bed, the noises from the storeroom are tremendous, as if furniture was being piled against the door, as if china was being moved about, and occasionally a long and fearful sigh or wail. Sometimes as I walk along the hall, I feel as if someone was watching me, going to touch me, you cannot understand it if you've not experienced it, but it's real. As I was dressing for breakfast one morning, B, who is four years old, came to my room and asked me why I'd called him. I told him that I'd not called him, that I'd not been in his room. With big and startled eyes, he said, Who was it then that called me? Who made that pounding noise? I told him it was undoubtedly the wind rattling his window. No, he said, it was not that. It was somebody that called me. Who was it? And so on he talked, insisting that he'd been called and for me to explain who it, who it had been. 
Some nights after I'd been in bed for a while, I've felt as if the bedclothes were jerked off me, and I've also felt as if I'd been struck on the shoulder. One night I woke up and saw, sitting on the foot of my bed, a man and a woman. The woman was young, dark and slight, and wore a large picture hat. I was paralysed and could not move. Most people would find this pretty terrifying while also being completely certain of the explanation. All of these solutions commit the same logical mistake, assuming that the answer is known when actually it isn't. Most people jump to a conclusion and then stick with it without ever reconsidering their assumptions. A better approach would be If we are scientific thinkers, we don't jump to conclusions, nor take other people's conclusions at face value. We test. We start from a position of not knowing, where we're completely open-minded. Then we begin building up real knowledge with careful experiments and reflection. Here we need to stop and consider what investigations we could do. This would be quite lengthy, so we won't have time in this video to go through it all. The point is that if we think carefully, we can design experiments that will give us information and help us start ruling out what it's not. If the camera captures images similar to what this family reported seeing, then our hypothesis is disproven. This confirms that there really is something there. Today, we'd install video cameras throughout the house, but even in 1921, they had some camera options available. These investigations didn't find anything so we move on to other possibilities. This would be a very tedious video if we went through every conceivable test and its possible outcome. In science, we cast our net widely and rule out answers that don't fit. Suffice to say that we should separately look at every physical variable, temperature, looking for cold spots, environmental conditions including ultrasound and infrasound, and whatever else we can think of. This would be a lot easier today than in 1921, but nevertheless, they did test everything they could, and the results were extremely interesting. It turns out the house's old furnace was leaking carbon monoxide. It was going into the house rather than up the chimney as it was supposed to. Carbon dioxide is really dangerous. It's a colorless and odorless gas, which also readily attaches to hemoglobin, the blood's oxygen-carrying molecule. So carbon monoxide prevents the blood from carrying the normal amount of oxygen to the body, the brain in particular. Oxygen deprivation causes many symptoms, including hallucinations. Our 1921 family got the furnace fixed and the visitations ceased. This can be a strong lesson for us all. The answer may not be what you assumed nor what someone else assumed. Your first ideas will usually be simplistic and wrong. If in doubt, test. If you don't know what something is, try to rule out what it's not. We may not all grow up to be scientists, but a little known fact is that anyone can use the scientific method to investigate things we're unsure about. With some careful experiments and interpretation, we can use what we know to make predictions and solve some very complex problems. If you have any questions, please send them in, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for watching.